about Lucasfilm is everybody is working around the same story ideas, the same values, and everybody involved sets a very high bar in terms of quality. It's an incredibly collaborative, warm-hearted company with a lot of really experienced, creatively engaged people in it. Whether it's games, theme parks, consumer products, digital technology, it's important to have story, to have people feel something. You have the opportunity to work side by side with people who pioneered an entire industry. People who've got that passion, that audacity to think that there is no story point or imagery that is asked of us that we won't be able to figure out. When you're near somebody who's expressing a high level of creativity that inspires you, you get a group like that together and amazing things happen. We're really able to push the envelope driving new forms of entertainment in completely uncharted territory. This is a job of imagination and dreams. We all try very hard to make the magic happen. I love the creative process, working on story, inventing things, and what better way to do that than inside the Star Wars universe? Every division is working with such passion. It just gives me goosebumps, the idea of what's coming. Lucasfilm and the art of storytelling. Let's keep the applause going as I bring them up. Please welcome these leaders from Lucasfilm, the Executive Vice President, General Manager of Lucasfilm, and President of ILM, Linwin Brennan. Come on up, Linwin. Chief Creative Officer of Industrial Light and Magic, John Knoll. Senior Vice President of Development, Kiri Hart. Chief Technology Officer, Rob Bredo. Executive in charge of ILM X Lab, Vicki Dobbs Beck. Executive producer and supervising director of Star Wars Rebels, Dave Filoni. Head of Lucasfilm Games, Douglas Riley. And supervising sound editor at Skywalker Sound, Matthew Wood. Give the whole group a round of applause here. Welcome to the Galaxy Stage here at Star Wars Celebration. This is such an honor to have you all on stage. Thank you so much for coming. So I wanted to talk, just kick it off right away and talk about the culture at Lucasfilm. Uh, can you just tell us a little bit about the values that George Lucas brought to Lucasfilm and, uh, for, for so many years? Well, I always think of George as being the original rebel. And um, there's a little bit of a rebel in all of us, some more than others, Mr. Filoni. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Don't tempt me. Don't tempt me. <laughs> um, you know, he, he had this incredible foresight and vision, and he realized um, that he had to bring together this group of mavericks that also had the audacity to think that his vision would be possible, because everybody was telling him it was impossible. So that spirit of fearlessness is really in the DNA that's throughout all of the Lucasfilm companies. And um, what's also great at the moment is now that we've expanded throughout the world. You know, we, we started in San Francisco, but now we have an ILM office in London. Woo, ILM London. That's right. <laughs> We're filming in Pinewood, and we have offices in Singapore and in Vancouver, and they've all got very different personalities and cultures, but that spirit of sharing, that sense of community, that fearlessness is unique through all of them, and then it's all brought together with this passion for storytelling, which of course George had, and now when he handed the reins over to Kathy, that is her core tenet that we all live by. And so that, Lucasfilm is truly global now. It's so, what did you say, Singapore, 
uh, Vancouver, London, San Francisco. I imagine all, you're sourcing talent from all over the world now at this point, literally. That must be an incredible addition culturally to, to Lucasfilm. Um, now, I wanted to ask you too about, um, about uh, the, uh, the, the, the current day of Lucasfilm, the sort of the modern Lucasfilm, because I know that uh, that tradition continues. In fact, someone said, as we were working on this panel, that there are so many people that have been at Lucasfilm for a long time, right? 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, even 40 years, still at Lucasfilm, these pillars of culture. Um, how does George Lucas's uh, template for Lucasfilm, plus uh, you know, all the culture around the world, define the new era of Lucasfilm that we now find ourselves in? Um. You know, I, I, I think there is just so much commonality all the way through, and that's why people stay. Um, but when I say commonality, there is also that mixed into an environment where we're always doing something new. So we're always being challenged, and I think that that's why uh, people want to stay there for so long. Once you get there, it gets in your blood. You love working with the people that you're working with. Look at the people I get to work with every day. Um, and it's, it's, just, it's just an incredibly inspiring place to be. And that rebellious nature of George Lucas still continues today. Uh, John, you've said before that, that um, you know, a lot of his attitude was about being told, I can't do something. And he said, well, we got to figure out a way to do it. We have to push technology. Uh, you know, that spirit is still alive and well today. And that certainly is something that always inspired him. And you had firsthand experience with that. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, um uh, ILM was founded on the, just the idea that uh, um, George needed to put together a group that could do what the conventional wisdom was saying couldn't be done. And that, that spirit of, uh, you know, is there a better way to, to do things? Is there a way to reinvent the process um, is alive all day, every day. You know, it's a super exciting environment to be in. Um, I, I find uh, being surrounded by that caliber of talent to be just constantly energizing. And it's, it's also interesting that if you are a visual effects artist and you want to know, you know, how did they do those walkers in the snow back in 1979, 1980, you can go down the hall and yeah. ask that person how you did that. I mean, th that just must be a, a tremendous resource to all of you and to all the partners working around the world. Anyone have any comments or thoughts about that? Yeah, I, I feel very strongly since coming to Lucasfilm that one of the things that makes it um, a, an inspiring place to work is that there's an almost, there's a collaborative spirit and a, a, a sort of interdisciplinary approach to things that I feel like I've really only ever experienced before in academia. It's a, it's a sort of sense that you can, like you said, go down the hall and I can knock on John's door and I can ask him something and if he doesn't know, he can send me to someone else, but there's a feeling that everyone wants to share what they know and everyone is, you know, has sort of deep and rich and long experience um, doing the things that they do. And so there's a, um, a, a sense of the sort of the accessibility of all this expertise and when you're crafting a story or when you're putting a film together or a game or a show, there's nothing that is more helpful than feeling like, you know, everyone is willing to work with you and for you. Everyone collaborates on everything. I mean, that's really the way we feel and we see these three companies as one company. W would you say it's a generosity almost amongst different disciplines? Do you, that seems like a very strong part of the culture. Yeah? Yeah, for sure. Generosity and... Um a shared passion. Everybody feels so passionately, passionately about what we do. We want it to be the best, and we want, and that, that's infectious. And Linwood, you know, you once said, uh, and I'm sorry, I'm paraphrasing a bit here, but you once said a company's brilliance is born out of culture. That word, you know, that word culture. What does it mean to you, and what is that? Uh, what exactly did you mean by that, with regards to Lucasfilm in this new era? Um, well, that actually came out of um, when we were acquired by Disney and one of the first things that Bob Iger did was come up and visit the company and he talked about how important it was to preserve the cultures of the companies that Disney has acquired. You know, he's done that with Marvel, he's done that with Pixar, etc. And he assured us that that was important for him with Lucasfilm. And they really, really walked that walk because the, the, the fact is, is that a company's culture comes out in 
the products that they, they create. And it doesn't matter whether those products are, are, are films, or TV, or, or games, or consumer products, but I think that that, that spirit, spirit of innovation and, and um, family that is very um, important in, in our culture in Lucasfilm, I mean, we, it's often an overused term, right, that a company is, is, is a family, but it's really true in this case. And, you know, speaking of family, we're here at Star Wars Celebration, right? Uh, we're here with amongst all the fans out here listening. Star Wars uh, and Lucasfilm has had a tremendous relationship with its fans. How, has, how have fans and fan culture influenced Lucasfilm? How does it continue to influence Lucasfilm today? Everyone's looking at Dave. They start looking at Dave. Right? <laughs> so, Dave. Yes. <laughs> How, I'm how sitting you... here quietly, like I promised. <laughs> <laughs> you see, I haven't like said. I've had several right thoughts, now. by the way, but I've restrained myself. We'll and I waited for my lasts. scripted moment. That not that this is scripted. But I can say now <laughs> what I would like to say, David. You would like totally to talk unscripted. about. Totally unscripted. What would you like to talk I about? I would David? like to talk about. Um, <laughs> I would like to talk about fan culture and how fans inspire the Lucasfilm culture. Uh, can you speak to that? Mr. Dave I can speak to that as a fan myself, but it's you point to me and yet I know so many people up here are fans. I'm just the most talkative one, so <laughs> I don't get to talk, but we're here in the center of it all. I mean, look at the fans. The fans come to all the events. There was a period after Revenge of the Sith ended where you all remember that a lot of people are saying, well, that's over with, Star Wars is done. And the fans reacted to that. They weren't done with Star Wars yet. They're like, what are you talking about? This is really getting good now. This is exciting. And so. George created Clone Wars to kind of carry on it. But we kind of carried that for a 10 year period with fans and it's because of fans that they're interested in that, that that really stayed alive, that there was interest, that everything grew. And when it came back and when we transitioned to the Disney ownership of Star Wars with Lucasfilm, there was a big question, what is Star Wars going to be? And we took it also seriously that we need to address the fans' concern. We want to include them and let them know that it's going to be okay. We wanted to know it was going to be okay. We were going to work very hard to instill that because of the fans and our relationship with you. R2KT, uh, a, an astromech that came out of the fan group, the 501st, is you know in the film, was in Clone Wars, shows up all over the place, is in Lego. Because we respect the fans and want you to feel like you are heard. You know, so many events at this, Star Wars Celebration are because of fans and fans' interest in what you guys want to see out of the franchise and your trust of us. I can't begin to tell you how important that is. And, and I know because I would be sitting out there uh, just like you guys if I wasn't up here on this panel. Matt Wood and I were just backstage going, can you believe that we're about to go on a panel that's like the leadership of Lucasfilm? <laughs> I know. <laughs> like, what is that about? Like, and at the same time, it's awesome. It makes you think it's deeply flawed because it's us, you know, <laughs> but, but, but we love Star Wars and, and that really came down from like what Lyndon said, said in the beginning, George and his kind of rebelness and believing that like it is a, a universal story, acknowledging that and empowering us to tell these stories and get them to you and let you be a part of it and feel a part of it and have a celebration. Nothing else has a celebration. And the reason I say of all the conventions, this is the best is because you've all come together for one common thing. You love Star Wars. How many people are from all over the globe because you love Star Wars, right? You have that in common. And look at what that love inspires. And I wish so many things in the world were that easy, right? If we could just say, hey, but we all love this. We're all the same. Let's get together and celebrate. So let's take this attitude you've created this weekend out into the world as well because that's what Star Wars is about. Love, selflessness, greatness. Continue, David. I'm Kiri. 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 Kiri Hart, my friend. Uh, I was going to say that I think the, I mean, I was a fan of, uh, of Star Wars from the time I was seven years old, and I think that there is nothing that gives you more passion to make something excellent than love of it, right? And there are yeah. so many things that people do in entertainment for a lot of different reasons, but the thing that is sort of really pure about uh, the experience of Lucasfilm is that we are all fans and we do know what we would like to see. We think about that a lot. Yeah. We think about what you guys would like to see. We think about what's meaningful to you. Um, we plan for that. I mean, we just had a huge reveal of uh, Grand Admiral Thrawn yesterday. For those of yeah. you that got to see that, that was super exciting. 
And that's an example of something that we conspired about for a long time. To say, years, like, how can, I, literally years, years. Yeah. how can we, we know the fans will love this. We know we would love it. How can we make it happen? Um, so there's a lot of thinking that goes into that. And I think it's partially because of, of our own, um, you know, love of this. And then I think the thing that's really great is that as we've been building our sort of, you know, uh, family of filmmakers, writers and filmmakers, as you guys know, Gareth Edwards could not be a bigger Star Wars fan. I mean, the man went to Tunisia with blue dye so that he could make some blue milk to drink while he was in, you know, like in the, <laughs> on the location. So, so there's um, a huge amount of, of love in the filmmaker uh, group that we're building as well for this. And I think they're able to feel at home because they feel like this is something that they know uh, and, they, and they know it as fans and now they get to know it as creatives as well. We'll have to do blue water next time for the for this panel of Star Wars fans. <laughs> it's very comforting to to know uh, that Star Wars is in such good hands, and and being a fan is such an important part of the passion that is also a huge part of the culture. And so here in this new era of Lucasfilm, uh, we have something that we've heard about a lot, we've talked about it a lot. But now that you're here, we have this opportunity to ask about Story Group. Ba -bum. Ba -bum. <laughs> I wanted to ask about Story Group. Uh, how did Story Group start? What were the origins of Story Group? Can you just uh, kind of give us a glimpse inside the life of Story Group? Okay, so S Story Group started because we were, um, you know, Kathy took over uh, uh, Lucasfilm at a moment that George was uh, about to step away, and we had a little bit of overlap, right? We had a, a little bit of time where, and which was really amazing for me to get to, to just be exposed to George a little bit and see his process and the way that he thinks and 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 does things. But I think that we realized, you know, that that we needed a development group to help start kick, you know, sort of sort of kickstart and spark the um, development of a bunch of new movies and a lot of other content. And I think that um, what we saw as a really unique opportunity at Lucasfilm was the fact that we, as you guys know, we make content on a lot of different platforms, and we wanted a group that sort of formed a hub that could sort of support all of those different types of storytelling and help coordinate them and bring them together and make them feel unified. So that's really the goal of the story group to um, help you know, support all the different storytellers and give them the, the um, kind of creative inspiration that they need, the uh, encouragement that they need, and um, hopefully the information that they need to help make whatever individual projects they're doing feel connected to the other things that are going on in the Star Wars universe. And we do that, again, we do that for you guys. We want people to feel like there's a seamlessness to this. And I know that's what I want from it and what I really celebrate about it. And I think that that's what uh, we want the group to be able to service. So you, you spend a lot of time working with different media, as you said. Um, how do you go about, or what is the process of deciding which story element goes into which media? So for example, the first thing that comes to mind for me is games. Douglas Riley over here sitting to Dave Douglas Trump. Riley, it's your turn. So, but I, this is actually uh, really fascinating. So, um, The Force Awakens, there were there were books, there were games, there was the movie, of course. Uh, there were tie-ins all over the place. So, if you're in Story Group and you're working on games, how do those conversations about bringing The Force Awakens to different platforms or different media? How do those conversations go? Yeah. So we were really looking for a way in games going forward to tell new stories. We don't want to tell the same movie story in a game. We want to give players an experience that's new and tell something different. And we were working on Battlefront, and Battlefront was set in the classic era. And we were really trying to find a way to connect it to The Force Awakens, even though we were going to be out before the movie. So we sat down with the story team, Diana, Pablo, and we thought up a way to tell the story of the Battle of Jakku 30 years before TFA comes out. So we sat down with the team, sketched out what that battle would look like, tried to figure out how that could play into what the DICE team at Battlefront does really well in terms of multiplayer. Then we sat down with Doug Chang, brought him all the way out to Stockholm, made sure that the vision for the game matched what the film was going to look like. And all along the way, we met with ILM and Sky Sound to make sure that that delivered on the payoff of the film when we were delivering an experience you were going to see two weeks before you actually got into a seat in a theater. And it was really, really remarkable to make that payoff and give fans a chance to peek at something that they were going to see later on and have it feel really deeply connected to the movie experience. You know, something you said reminded me, too, of, of, of something unique about Lucasfilm and working with Lucasfilm on all kinds of different media is that if you're working on a game, you're working on a TV show, you're working on a novel, a, a comic book, you get to work with Doug Chang. You get to work with Matthew Wood. You get to work with Story Group and ILM. So, so anyone working on The Force Awakens is working with the same creatives 
uh, on, on not just The Force Awakens, but any of the, of the movies or, or all of the initiatives are, are, are one. Can you describe a little bit, uh, maybe your experience? Uh, Matthew, we had a great uh, panel yesterday, uh, yesterday about Lego Star Wars, the Freemaker Adventures. Can you describe working with them and their reaction to basically working with you being on the films? Well, yeah, I mean, Skywalker Sound was born out of George Lucas really having a love for sound. He talked about sound being something that um, was 50% of the experience of what you experience in a movie theater, you know? And sound is this subliminal, almost emotional way to enhance the story that would give us a really unique perspective on the project that we can kind of um, get in there in a way that visuals can't because you're, you're just feeling it and not seeing it. And to have this incredible library that we've created over the last 40 years at Skywalker from the likes of Ben Burt, the original sound designer on, right. on Star Wars, and all the projects we've done at Skywalker. We have a, a Sundance lab that we actually bring new filmmakers in and train them about composition of music as well as sound. And we, uh, we do Pixar's movies and Marvel's films. So we have a large you know, library that we've created at Skywalker. But the great thing, too, about Star Wars is that we've kept our the, the jewels of, of what we created in sound is very special, you know, and it's, it's you're not going to hear the sound of a TIE fighter in another movie, you know, and so we have this um, respect for what's come in Star Wars, and it's our job, my job, my crew's job to make sure that's across everything, whether it be VR, video game, animation, a feature, we just want to have that same sort of patina like, on everything uh, for Star Wars. So if you're working on, like, Lego Star Wars The Force Awakens, for yeah. example, they get access to you and the incredible sounds. They get access to Story Group. Um, th that's just that's just incredible to me. Um, and they get access to the incredible minds uh, at ILM and now ILM X Lab as well. Now I, I want to talk about this. We had an incredible panel yesterday here on the Galaxy Stage. How many of you saw the ILM X Lab panel yesterday? Now, how many of you got to see the experience on the show floor? Yeah, come on, give it up for ILM X Lab, right? ILM X Lab, for those of you who don't know, we have Vicki Dobbs back here. Vicki is the executive in charge of ILM X Lab. Vicki, can you just kick us off and tell us what is ILM X Lab for those that maybe don't know yet? Sure. So, ILM X Lab is a division we formally launched about a year ago, and it is really designed to create premium story based immersive entertainment experiences. And a lot of people ask, well, what's an immersive entertainment experience? Well, that's something that's been enabled by this what many are calling disruptive technologies, um, virtual reality and mixed reality. And it provides a unique storytelling platform that we're incredibly excited to bring into the Star Wars universe. Um, one of the things about uh, immersive entertainment is that we literally can allow people to step inside the worlds of our stories. And we were talking a little bit about the role of Story Group. Well, ILMX Lab actually brings together the you know, world-class production capabilities of ILM and Skywalker Sound. It builds on an incredible foundation of R&D in um, high-fidelity real-time graphics and virtual production. But probably most significantly, it's centered in story, because that's really at the heart and soul of everything that we're doing. And we've been talking about with Story Group, like what can we do uniquely with this platform that we couldn't really do any other way. And we talked about the fact that because it is so visceral and it's so impactful and it can be so personal and intimate that we actually wanted to explore a character in that world. And so yesterday um, we announced that we're in development on a, on a VR experience that's focused on Darth Vader. And we're incredibly excited about that opportunity. Um, we've also brought in David Goyer, who's a world-class writer and director to work with us on that project. And how yeah, did I think, we, I oh, think, sorry, go ahead. I think the um, thing that we're really excited about is that we don't know what this form is going to do yet. We, it's, it's so new. And it feels like every time we do it, we, we learn. Every time we build something, we learn. And, and I think that it's a, um, it, 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 what we know is that there's, as Vicky was saying, a sort of connection that you can form um, or, or a set of emotions that you can experience when you're in proximity to a character that's really different from experiencing them on a flat screen. And uh, I think that, that this opportunity that we're about to pursue is, is going to really show us so much about, about how we can make people feel something so that this is not just a, a visual gimmick, but it's something that really becomes a storytelling platform and that's what we're passionate about. 
one of the things that I think was very intentional about the naming of this group, ILMX Lab, is the word lab. And Kiri just alluded to it because we knew that this was the beginning of a journey, that we're really at the beginning of a new form of storytelling and that we were going to learn and discover. And we just wanted to be really upfront about that fact. And so we're incredibly excited. Um, Trials on Tatooine, which I know some of you got to experience, was in fact exactly that. It was an experiment in trying to understand the balance between interactivity and light story and looking for that optimal balance. We learned from that. Um, we have had incredible reception and we will definitely use those learnings as we look forward to our next experiences. So you mentioned story a few times there and it's important. It's so central to XLab. Is that maybe, Douglas, what separates uh, XLab from games, or can you elaborate on sort of the difference between games and ILM XLab? Yeah, so what we're doing on the game side is trying to really deliver on the payoff of a game experience within VR. But we have been working very deeply with the ADG and XLab teams with DICE. They've been sharing technology and techniques. Uh, yesterday, we announced that there's a VR mission for Battlefront coming this fall, and we'll be talking about a lot uh, later this summer. But it's really about giving you that visceral experience of being able to play a game in a VR space in Star Wars, whether that's in the cockpit of an X-Wing or whatever, that's going to pay off in those headsets in a way you've never seen before. So they're still, they're, they're related, um, you know, and they kind of, there's a lot of crossover. Um, I'm just so inspired by how story is so central to everything that you do, even when it comes to technology, right? And, and speaking of technology, I, I want to talk about ILM. ILM, as we know, has a very rich, incredible history. I'm so humbled to be standing on stage with you, Linwin, and John Knoll, and, and Rob, and Vicky. Uh, I want to talk about the role that visual effects play in story. Um, and specifically, I had a, a couple questions for you, John, that I wrote down. Um, do you have any sort of historic examples of, let's say you look at a script, right? You, you bid on a, a show, you look at a script, and uh, there's a line in the script you know, that maybe gives a sense of, of space or something, and now you have to turn it into an entire sequence, an entire visual yeah. sequence, uh, with that coming from you and, or, or, and with Skywalker Sound. Can you give us some historic examples of that? Uh, well, different projects come to us with different levels of, uh, of exploration on, on look. Sometimes it's, uh, it's really, literally just a line in a script. Uh, a good example uh, is from Episode one, actually, uh, I think George intended the pod race development to be uh, for that to proceed visually. So in the script, I think it really didn't say a whole lot more than and then they race. And then they race. Yeah. That's and it. They race. <laughs> uh, but at, uh, uh, I think we got a clip of the uh, pseudopod from the abyss. Uh, you know, that was just uh, described in the script as this uh, you know shimmering tentacle of water and. Uh, you know, that was up to us to figure out, uh, all right, so what does that really mean? What does it look like? How do we actually execute that? Get the images up on screen. And uh, it was, that was a huge amount of fun. All of this was all so new. We were kind of making it up as we went along. Yeah, John's sort of underplaying how new this was. Like, this is one of the very first times you're seeing CG ever in a film composited this way, right, John? I mean. This is extremely yeah. early. To where today, this is more commonplace, but this is extremely early innovative work being done in this space. Oh, it, yeah, it all looks pretty primitive now, but uh, <laughs> it's well, hard to do back at the time. This was 1989, is that right? Yeah. 1989. So this was, this was something you had to develop specifically for this. This was new technology that was just emerging. Yeah, there, there are a lot of techniques that are used pretty commonly and are standardized across the whole industry that were done for the first time on the, the show just because we'd stand around and all right, how do we want to solve this? Well, I don't know, I think we should do this. And we do that and then that would, now how everybody does it. Right, right, so yeah, you, you yeah. create something and then it just becomes the industry standard, right? Yeah, uh, we have another example, I, I think, uh, from uh, the J.J. Star Trek movie uh, with a black hole. And you can imagine that uh, this, again, the, the description in the script is really just about, uh, all right, and then the black hole forms and it sucks the ship into it. Now, what does that actually, look like. Uh, there's an infinite number of different ways that that could proceed. So it gives us a, a lot of room to explore and try exciting and striking new ways of depicting things like that. Kathy always brings up a story of um, some of the early days that she worked with ILM and um, the challenge that Stephen threw down to her to say that the dinosaurs need to run. 
In Jurassic Park. In Jurassic Park. The dinosaurs need to run. That's yeah. all, it, all he said. The dinosaurs need to run, and that ended up being a huge challenge for us that yeah. we had to um, create a whole new way of, of working. You know, as an audience member, it seems so... You, you take it for granted now. But back in the early 90s when that was in development, that must have been a, a terrifying prospect and you didn't know oh, how exciting. it was going to go. No, it's exciting. Exciting, there we go, yeah. yes. So a lot of the most fun <laughs> projects we ever do visual worked effects. on. I, I don't know, like, call, call John Nolan. The, the, the most exciting projects we work on are the ones where you're not quite sure how you're going to do it. You know, when you read the, the script and it's not obvious, well, I'm not quite sure how we're going to do this. And, you know, they're a little terrifying, but they're, there's wonderful excitement as part of that. And we have this tremendous bench of talent that if I don't know what the solution is to a problem, somebody on my team will. And, and this process has never failed us. It's and, and I would go in further, sorry. Um, somebody better take the mic away from microphone away from me. Um, uh, I'd go in even further in that we actively look for that in projects. We look for at least a couple of projects a year that we look around the room and say, anybody know how to do this? And, and if the answer's no, then that's when we say, okay, that's the one. Back to that rebellious <laughs> spirit of George Lucas, right? Yeah. So absolutely. you're constantly pushing the envelope. I just get so inspired. Like John Noel, when you talk about these things, your face lights up and you get excited. And it's very inspiring to see that creative energy here on stage and, and see that culture going. Rob, same with you. So now you're the CTO of, of ILM. You're still pushing the boundaries to, the, to this day in productions that are going on even now. Yeah, it's pretty amazing to get to be a part of productions that are at this scale and are willing to be this ambitious with the kind of things we make. Um, I, we, were, it, we were talking a little bit earlier about virtual reality. Virtual reality is a very technically challenging area. Uh, very commonly on these movies, we'll render a frame that might take 10 or 20 or even 30 hours of frame to put something really complicated on the screen. With virtual reality, we have 11 thousandth of a second to get the next frame to the headset. And if we don't do that reliably, it's not a comfortable experience. So you must do it in 11 milliseconds. So those kind of technical challenges are incredibly fun for our team to dive into. And we have technology teams in every section around the world, here in London, in Singapore, at our, of course at our headquarters in San Francisco, up in Vancouver. These tech teams are diving into these things and reinventing our technology so we can use, benefit from the legacy of the technology we've created and then use it in these new areas. Um, one fun thing we just did, well, on, on Rogue One, on the show John is supervising right now, um, we were doing, oh, it's this ship right yeah. here. The ship you see on the screen um, needed to appear in the film, and it was early in the design stage, and they'd seen drawings and the 3D models, of course, sketch models when, we were, when Gareth and the team and, and Doug Chang's team were designing it. Um, but there were some questions about how it was going to be used and how he was going to get a shot. So we actually put a virtual reality headset on Gareth put him in a primitive model of the ship, and he could look around the door, look to see where the engine was, and actually in that case, like in the first five minutes, he's like, oh, we need to pull the engine two feet forward, and can we make this door a little bit wider so I can get this shot when I go over the shoulder of the guy who's got the gun? And um, like five minutes into the experience, he said, this is so much better in real life. And I, I leaned over to Doug Chang, and I'm like, Doug, have you already built this somewhere that I don't know about? And he's like, no, when he says real life, he means in the virtual reality headset he's in right now that he's only been in for five minutes. This is literally set design using virtual reality. Yeah. This is becoming more and more commonplace. Yeah. And if I can explain kind of what this, this image actually is, um, it, well, one of these, these uh, themes that runs deep in the culture of Lucasfilm is this, uh, you know, is there a better way of, of doing, solving a problem. And certainly we've shot lots and lots of, of actors in spaceship sets in front of a, a process screen of one kind or another. But this was us looking at, is there a better way to do this that'll get uh, a better looking imagery? And so there's a technique that we've used for years in computer graphics of using images to light CG objects. And, and this is using that uh, image-based lighting technique, pulling it back into the real world. So what we've got there are these very big, bright LED screens that completely surround a subject, and we prepare graphics in advance that are what this environment is, where this, this, uh, uh, this spaceship is going to be. And then those are playing back, and they light the scene. And it's, it gives you a level of quality and, and realism that's, uh, that's just 
hard to achieve any other way. There's all kinds of subtle things going on that I, you would see in the, the dailies from this, where you'd see a pilot wearing a, a helmet, you see all the, the bright reflections in the helmet and on the surfaces in the ship, and it's a, it's a subtle thing, but it just makes it all look better. And so, certainly we could have done this the same way we've done things like this on previous shows, but we're looking for ways to, what, what can we do to take this to the next level, to make these things better? So it's all in camera that way, basically, right? It's all in the set for, for the most well, part. Well, these, these, are, these are not the final graphics. These are representative of the lighting ratios and colors that we're going to do, but I see. we're still going to do you know, really awesome looking graphics there. It's more about lighting on the actors. But, but that inspiration must be tremendous for the actors as well, because they're oh, yeah. able to kind of get a real emotional sense yeah, so it's good for the photographic image in that we get this higher quality result, but sort of a, uh, a benefit of this is now the actors kind of know where to look and they have a sense of what's going on, so it improves performance as well. This is the most expensive virtual reality rig probably ever made, right? Because we're putting people, like the really yeah. funny thing for me was like I stood in that place that we put Gareth on, in this ship, and then I happened to be on set this day because we were doing a bunch of extra testing with those LED arrays. And like you're standing in the ship, and the ship, as you can tell, is on a what, 12 or 15 foot motion base? Yeah. You can really throw that thing around. So you're in this like custom built, like superstar tours ride, right? That you can throw the actors around, and like nobody has to act because they, they are scared, they are seeing the things fly by. <laughs> it's pretty amazing to just be able to be there. And uh, you, now you're, you're developing this, but you also uh, develop with um, cutting edge partners as well, right? Like Vicky, you, you had mentioned this before with ILM X Lab, you have cutting edge partners that you're developing alongside with. Yeah, we just um, announced recently a strategic collaboration with Magic Leap, which is um, a real innovator in the area of mixed reality. So this is the future when um, we're gonna have glasses that people wear more like they would wear a common pair of glasses and digital and virtual elements are introduced into the real world. So there's an image up there of a um, piece that we created that shows C-3PO and R2-D2 and a um, holographic battle taking place in the real world. Um, that's actually a, um, a video piece that you can, can look at online. But it's incredibly exciting, not only to innovate on the technology, but actually applying that, uh, that innovative technology to storytelling. So that's one of the things that um, we're really looking forward to in the years ahead. And it has applications for the home, and it has applications for locations like theme parks and, and all kinds of public venues. So it's going to be a really exciting um, next era. <laughs> So just in case it isn't super obvious from this image that you're seeing on the screen, this is someone's real office, um, and then the droids and the hologram that the droids are projecting into the room are computer generated in real time to make look like they're really real, and if you put this prototype headset on right now, this is actually what you see. So as you look around, these computer generated droids can walk around. So you can just sort of imagine the possibilities of this. And this wasn't some visual effects mock-up of what it might look like. This, we took one of our cameras, one of our film quality cameras, and put it behind a prototype of their glasses and photographed it. So it'd be kind of like a version of what you would see if you put the glasses on, because millions of people can't put the glasses on, but millions of people can watch this on YouTube, which is what's happening right now. People are getting excited about what the next possibilities are if we can mix um, story and computer graphics and visual effects into the real world. And one of the um, things that was really special about this, I think this is probably the highest fidelity example of this work yet shown, and it really underscores the power of the underlying R&D work that has been um, done at Lucasfilm, because that's what it's enabled us to create this. Uh, and because it's so high fidelity, that's what's contributing to your sense that these things, this is a real world experience in which both of these um, real world elements and virtual world elements live together in a seamless way. It's inspiring to listen to how it's all connected and you're all kind of jumping in and talking about each other's disciplines, but they're all still very much uh, linked together creatively. I want to go back to you, Matthew Wood. Um, uh, talk a little bit about Skywalker Sound again. You mentioned telling stories, you mentioned Sundance Labs, um, but you also deal with dialogue in sound. You deal with uh, voiceover direction. You've had experiences where you're crafting story using the soundtrack as well. Uh, and you touch not only the soundtracks of, of all of these, but certainly the films. Can you just talk a little bit about your experience in putting together things just using dialogue? 
Yeah, I mean, anything that's in the soundtrack that passes through our department would be basically everything except for John Williams' music. So it's all the dialogue, it's all the foley, it's all the sound effects, which we had a great library for. But it's because we're allowed to be involved in the process so early, you know, we get in when the script's being made. I get a chance to come in and read the script way before shooting starts to get inspired. And one of the things, like just for example, for dialogue would be uh, Kylo Ren's character. We, you know, in the, in the script we see he's got a mask and, and it's used, I was trying to get an assessment of like, is it used to keep him alive? Is it used as an intimidation factor? So part of that uh, discussion I had with Adam Driver was, let's have you hear what the mask sounds like in real time. So I was able to create a whole process for him to have headphones on while he's performing and he can get all microphonic up on it, be really creepy about his, his performance, and hear it in real time, like what it would sound like for the other actors or, or the other characters in that scene. And something like that, I, that's, the opportunities to do that is, is very unique to Skywalker, that we can come on so early, we can, we can get access to the scripts, we can interact with the actors and record them, and I can spend, I spent several hours with Adam Driver just working on all of that so he could really feel like he owned that mask, it was real, and it was, it was, a, it was a tool for him for intimidation. So that's just like one, yeah, one example of that. It's a, Skywalker Sound is also one of our greatest allies in that, uh, when we're working on the visual effects on a movie, I, you know, I'm, I'm looking at this stuff silent. Over and over and over again, we're picking it apart and talking about it. Uh, and there's a moment on every production that is just one of the more delightful things. It's when we start seeing sounds attached to the, to the, to the visuals. And when I see the film with uh, final sound mix, it makes all our shots look better. So totally thank you. Does, does. Yeah, no problem. Well, the same sort of like getting the actors into their characters is technologies that we've been developing for a while and are really very, very useful today. Like we actually released a still of uh, Maz's character being acted in real time so that the actors, actresses can get a sense of what it's like to perform a virtual character. And we're starting to, you know, virtual characters have been done now since, you know, some of the, uh, the prequels for sure, but being able to have the actors really involved in the creation of those characters, influencing the design, influencing the proportions, influencing just the way they act in those scenes and, and changing their performances to fit these characters, I think we're seeing a different level of performance out of these digital actors, you know, in, by, by real, you know, act, world-class actors performance, performing them. And you're all at the same companies, so you're all able to see all of this process happening from pre-production all the way to post-production. So, Kira, you, you once told a really great story about when you were at Skywalker Ranch. Yeah. Do you want to share that story? Sure. I, um, I spend some Fridays at Skywalker Ranch. It's my sort of place to kind of go and, and spend the day and catch up. And I often run into Mr. Filoni there. Um, and uh, on this particular day, we were, the story group was there. We were all kind of working on something. And Dave came and knocked on the door and said, hey, come here. I want you to see something. So then I went down the hall with him and I went into a very small dark room and, and in it were wedged like pretty much everyone from Sky Sound that you could possibly imagine, including Matt. Um, fine tuning to like the, the nth degree, the season two finale of Rebels, which is brilliant by the way, if you've never seen it, you should go watch it right after yeah. this. Um, and what it did for me was just remind me of the love and care that everybody puts into everything at Lucasfilm and the collaboration, as I said, that is across platforms, everybody works on everything, everybody cares about it because it's like, if it's, if it's coming from this company, it has to be excellent and we love it. And it just warmed my heart to kind of like walk into this room and see all these people wedged in there, like who totally could be doing other things, but they were all super focused on getting this exactly right. Uh, and they did. And I think that that's what I think is um, extremely special about the environment that we all get to work in. Culmination of so much hard work across so many disciplines coming together at the very end. I want to talk about uh, the future of Lucasfilm. I, uh, because we have this incredible group, story group driving as sort of a, a creative engine that touches every, develop, or every project in development. All of the uh, creative technologies, uh, the visual effects, XLab, everything. It seems to me that you have this uh, wonderful uh, situation, this pipeline, if you will, set up for the future to do all kinds of amazing creative work uh, for Star Wars. Actually, even beyond Star Wars, you know, uh, you're just set up to do such amazing st storytelling things. Do you mind just talking to us a little bit about uh, the future and how you, you see it? A little bit. A little bit. <laughs> just a little bit, just for us. Um, you know, I think the 
Kerry just put it um, really well, which is, I think what's really unique is that we are looking at things really holistically. And Kerry and her group have plotted out our story uh, timeline across all these multiple platforms for many years in advance. Um, many exhausting <laughs> years. <laughs> many in exhausting years in advance. <laughs> But what that's allowed us to do is not only make sure that everything is done at the highest quality and that it all feels connected and it's all authentic and that every platform is being used um, for what it does best, it also makes sure that we tell the right stories because, as you said, the possibilities are endless, but we also need to be wise about it because we're fans. We also want to make sure that we create... Um, the best quality stories for fans, but we don't overdo it. You know, we don't. Almost, yeah. Yeah, we, we, we have to practice restraint for sure, um, because it, that it's a, such a precious jewel that we have um, the great honor to have a responsibility for, and we want to be real careful with that. Not only with Star Wars, but with Indiana Jones, which we're all very excited about as well. <laughs> So I think we all feel like it's, it's a real gift that we are going to take great care with. We actually, earlier this week, uh, took some questions from Twitter with the hashtag Lucasfilm Life. And many of you uh, wrote in and had some questions for us, and we wanted to share a couple of the questions from the fans for this panel here and take that opportunity. The first one is from Tricia, and she says, what's involved in the collabor collaborative process between story group writers and directors? Uh, I think it's different every time. I think every project is different, and we do try to sort of build the process around the filmmakers and writers uh, and content creators that we're working with, so we really try to make a process that's comfortable for them, that feels familiar to them, um, and that can range from, you know, sort of uh, the, the sort of deep immersion in San Francisco that Orion Johnson had. He came up and, you know, lived in San Francisco for many weeks, and went to an office that was right next door to everybody on my team and met with Doug Chang and, and, and just really immersed himself uh, to get to arrive at what his story was gonna be and then um, spend some time you know, off in LA writing his script. But he started at this sort of foundational experience of being, being with us and being really immersed. Other people have done it differently. I think there's a lot of ways to do it. I mean, Dave, you can talk a little bit We've, we've had a great collaboration with you and your animation team, um, which has been, I think, it can be sparked by all manner of different things. Yeah, well, I made sure my office is right next to Kiri's, so she loves that fact. And it's, the proximity <laughs> do, is important because she has so many meetings, I have so many meetings. I will literally see her in the office, make sure she's not on the phone, and then run in there and say, I have an idea, I think this should happen, and this is how I want to solve it, what do you think? And we'll solve it right there. But that collaboration, point blank, is really important. If I can't get to Kiri, I'll go to Rain's office, which is right next door to hers. And then Rain and I will hash it out. I would run into Ryan Johnson in the hallway, where I found out he had a friend that loved the Ada driver, and I love the Ada driver, it's my favorite Imperial. So I got him a giant Ada driver the next time he showed up to make him know that like, we want him to be a part of this, and it's exciting. But you have to have as many shots at getting these stories right before they're done and out the door. I mean, and I can't stress how important that is. So you're always like, I brought Kiri into Skywalker Sound in that room to have her look at it and say, I think we're getting there and I want you to be excited about this, but I also want to know if there's something you see that I don't. And that's a lot of what the story group and that collaboration is about to me. Here's another one from Jacob, Luke, hashtag Lucasfilm Life. While working at Lucasfilm, do you ever get Star Wars fatigue? Ah. If so, how do you deal with it? So, you know, I think the reality of it is we're all fans, and we've talked about being fans, so I don't think it's necessarily Star Wars fatigue, but I know for those of us who've been there for a long time, before the change with Story Group and the Disney acquisition and the new movies, uh, it was a little unclear what kind of stories we were going to be telling going forward and how we were going to keep that creative energy going. And I think with the story team and all this stuff, for the games folks in particular, we're getting an opportunity we've never had to tell stories for the first time that are connected to other things we're doing, I'm going to plug a little bit for the LEGO panel that's coming next, but in the LEGO game, we actually got to tell a number of stories in that game that are going to be in Marvel Comics later on or, or from shorts or other kinds of things. And I think the energy is so high to, to be able to, to do new things and tell new stories. But yeah, there's no Star Wars fatigue. There's no, because if you do yeah. get a little tired, maybe so, but probably not. 
you just have to come to celebration and see how excited all of you are. Yeah. And then I go back and tell my crew, it's like, guys, we got to work. This is, they're really invested in, it really does get me reinvested. I'm sure you guys all feel the same. I, I feed off of the reactions you guys have and the emotions you guys have. And when you come and stop me in the hallways and stuff, I see how much it means to you. I, I can't allow myself to get fatigued over that because we all know how much you're counting on us. So it's, it's not a problem. There was an R2. Nice. There was an R2 unit going down the, wheeling down the hallway the other day. And, um, there was, and it was all employees. This wasn't like outside guests or anything. And there was a line of like 25 people. It was like a mini little celebration right outside my office with the R2 unit with people just wanting to get selfies with R2. And uh, most of those people have been there a lot longer than I have. And, and you know, I, so I got them the end of the line. <laughs> and we see R2 every day. So we're still excited about it. But I think the important thing is if it isn't exciting, we don't do it. Like that's what I mean about making sure it stays fresh. And I agree with you, there's no fatigue. And I have a seven-year-old boy who is in major zone of Star Wars fandom right now. So I get it at work and at home, and I'm still not fatigued. I'm a little tired. <laughs> yeah, we have regular fatigue. But I don't know con we have Star Wars fatigue. fatigue. Con fatigue. <laughs> Here's another one. How do you get all the ideas for the Star Wars films? Um, I think we have been really fortunate in that we uh, had some ideas that you know, that, that as we came into this process, we, we knew were things that George was excited to do and, and, um, and wanted to do. And, and obviously, I'm sure you all know the story of Rogue One and, and the fact that John, you know, came in and pitched that to us, uh, to Kathy and, and myself. And, and there are a lot of different ways that, that stories for films can come about. We certainly have some really great collaborative relationships with writers and filmmakers out there who uh, can come to us with ideas. Um, but we do want to generate a fair amount of stuff internally as well because we feel like we have a really strong um, bench of, of talent, as you can see here, and, and that's uh, a big part of how we start to think about ideas and, and just brainstorm together. We do a lot of roundtables with a lot of different people from a lot of different departments. Um, so there's um, lots of different ways that a, a movie idea can come about, and I think that's a healthy way to do it. I'm glad you brought up uh, John Knoll's uh, pitch for Rogue One. That really speaks to the culture as well. And uh, you had a line about that that you were saying. Actually, we were in rehearsal, and you said good ideas. Well, yeah, I mean that's something that's a deep part of uh, of ILM and Lucasfilm culture. Is a, a good idea is a good idea, no matter where it comes from. And something that uh, that I've tried to keep alive in, in the dailies on shows that I'm working on is uh, is. I do treat dailies a bit like a free-form brainstorming session. And while I definitely come into it with a point of view and ideas about where I want to go with the work, everyone knows that uh, if they've got an idea, they should say it. And we'll often talk through some of those ideas. And you know, if it's a good idea, it's going in. And it, it doesn't matter where it came from. And it, it just makes the work better. So. You know, that culture is alive all over Lucasfilm, and you know I had this idea for a for a film, and well, I should, here we should are. Go talk to Kerry about it. Yeah. Here we are. <laughs> so I have one more for us. This is from Aubrey. How is working at Lucasfilm on May the fourth? Is there a party, or is it like business as usual? <laughs> well, apart it's always from all a the... party with Dave Filoni. Uh, no, I don't know that that's true. I just like what would we do? Wear Star Wars T-shirts? That's like a daily occurrence. So it's hard to tell. <laughs> It's like, is it May the 4th today? It is May the 4th. All right, well, because it's more day celebration. Is May the 4th. Yeah, my wife doesn't look forward to May the 4th because that means Star Wars is even more everywhere than it is normally. <laughs> so I'm sure that, I'm not sure how I many she looks forward to it, but they, I, we celebrate it, you know. I don't yeah. know. There's I'm, more, more Wookiee costumes than usual. More Wookiee costumes <laughs> than usual, yes. Wookiees rise up more on May the 4th. But, you know, I, I live in a world where I, we'd love to have more droids in the hallways and stormtroopers. And I was saying on our floor, A2, to, to Kira, I was like, we should just have a stormtrooper that hangs out in the kitchen. Like, just by the coffee machine. Like, he's guarding it or something. I don't know. That's what people expect. Because I once did a talk via Skype to my old college, and I was like, can we get an R2 unit? Because they, they, they need to believe that we are half a foot into that galaxy. And so when I was talking to them via Skype, R2 came up and brought me a water. I was like, oh, hey, thanks, R2. And I was like, so anyway, so I was trying to get a job, and everyone was like, oh. R2. And he just rolled off. And I was like, what, R2? 
Oh, yeah, no, he's just here. So anyway, and I just, because that's, you, be, you want to believe that. It's like when you see a kid out here seeing R2 and that's the magic. And that's our job is to keep that magic alive and vibrant. So we do it on May the 4th and every day. I will say that we did play a cruel trick on our employees on May the 4th this year. We, we do have Stormtrooper models in the hallway, but on May the 4th, they went models and they jumped out and scared people on their way to dailies. <laughs> it was excellent. <laughs> oh, that's great. Anyone else? Dave? Yes. Any, any further comments? This is the, the part of the, at no, the end. I just, okay, I just yes. know, no, I know. I know that. I read, this, say, I read the thing. I I'm know. Well, but you told us. <laughs> I've been waiting for this. Listen, if the clock so gets zero. So much depends on this. I've got something Is there a say. clock? Oh, my gosh. Uh -huh. And it is at zero, uh -huh. sir. No. no pressure. Anyway, um, to, to make this spontaneous. <laughs> if it helps, we haven't heard this before. I know so. what you're thinking. We None have no them... idea what he's going to say. We're I a know. Scared. That's, that's what makes it exciting. I keep telling you. Um, I know what you're all thinking. But despite that, later today or in the years ahead, you will look back on this panel and realize this was the most important one you could come to all weekend long. And I'm glad it's filled. We wondered who's going to come and, and see a bunch of us talk about who knows what um, without, you know, a big trailer or something. But, and, and here's why I say it's important. Uh, when I, Star Wars for me, why is it important? Yeah, the story, all of that. But it's the first time I really connected a film with a filmmaker, George Lucas. And that made me look further and see, so why, I love those sounds. Okay, Ben Burt. But I love the visual effects. John Dykstra, Dennis Murin. I start to relate it to people. And the people, I have to tell you, it, you can't separate it from who's making Star Wars and behind the story. So when I got to Lucasfilm, I knew so, who so many of these people up here were. And that was so important to me to see that they were still there, to see that the same people that I grew up admiring were still taking care of this. And it made me want to take care of it in a very significant way. I would be like E.T. Remember E.T. in the scene when he's in Halloween and he's in the sheet and he sees Yoda and he's like, oh. And I'd be walking down the hallway and see Dennis Spear and be like, oh. And like just, you know, and like the, one day he said my name and I was like, yeah, hey. <laughs> you try to act all cool. You know, when I got to Skywalker to make Clone Wars, then the producer said, so we'll have to figure out where we're going to do sound. And I was like, what? We didn't figure it out. We're going to go right down the road and talk to Matt Wood. I had never met Matt Wood. I didn't know Matt Wood. But like you guys, I was introduced to him on an attack, uh, attack of the Clones featurette on StarWars.com where he ran around chasing a helicopter or something to make a sound biplane for a sound of a gunship, right? So I knew who he was, and I came at him like that, you know? A secret thing I do that not many people know is sometimes when I work late, I'll intentionally leave the building by the longest route possible to just walk through it. In our building, we have props, we have models, we have pictures of things from so many movies that you can't imagine. I'll see an image of Dennis Muren with an Oscar, and 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 then Doug Chang as well, and then John Knoll. Linwin has been at ILM a long time. And she started, she, she, you literally came up through the ranks to where you are now. That is amazing to me. And it speaks to how much you care about the company. I mean, everybody here loves it. And it's hard to be a bunch of people up here saying, hey, we love it like you. You know, we care about it like you. Because I get, why would you believe that? Why wouldn't we say that? But it is what we're about. Everybody here cares that deeply about it. And George cared that deeply about it. He cared so deeply about it that when he finally earned his moment to step away, he made sure that it would be taken care of, paramountly by Kathleen Kennedy, by bringing her in, which was significant to all of us, but then also by handing off to us all the keys one at a time over a long period of time. So there is no high and low at Lucasfilm. There's just our love of this, like you have it, we're gonna take care of it, and I'll tell you how we're gonna prove it to you, is every time you interact with something that's about Star Wars, you're gonna feel it just like we do. So thank you so much though, guys. And by being here, you have taken your first step into a larger world. <laughs> thank you, thank you to our panelists. Thank you to all of you. Thank you, Star Wars Celebration. Thank you so much, Linwin Brennan, John Knoll, Kiri Hart, Rob Bredo, Vicki Dobbs back,
Dave Filoni, Douglas Riley, and Matthew Wood, the leaders of Lucasfilm and the art of storytelling. Thank you so much. Thanks, you guys.